Well, I welcome you into our study this evening. We're one night later than we normally are for our midweek study. Uh, <clears throat> the weather coming in last night had a little bit to do with that, but but I thought we would um, do this on Thursday night this week. I uh, hope you're able to hear that uh, that song that I played before. Hope the audio was good enough to, to hear that familiar song um, that we sing from time to time, Peace, Perfect Peace. I was looking at that song uh, before this, and you know every verse of that song mentions Jesus, and, and that sort of underlines the point we've been developing in our study of peace, and that is that the peace is is not primarily the absence of something that is the absence of war or conflict or whatever it may be, but it's the presence of someone. And um, of course, in that song, it's the presence of Jesus and it makes it one of our great songs. So we're continuing this tonight and we're going to start looking at some of the words that are our translated piece in, in the Bible. And we're going to look at the major one tonight, uh, the major Old Testament word for peace. And then maybe we'll look at a couple of others before we finish uh, this particular study up. Um, but the, the most significant word for peace in the Old Testament is uh, the word shalom in, in Hebrew. Uh, translated normally peace in in our English translations. That word uh, occurs over 250 times in the Old Testament and really it's among the most important words in all the Old Testament. And uh, it, it's an interesting word. It's still used today. If you uh, are in modern Israel where they speak Hebrew, um, the word shalom is used as a greeting. In fact, <clears throat> you say it when you're saying hello, and you say it when you're saying goodbye in, in uh, common Hebrew speech today. So you say shalom to say hello, and shalom to say goodbye. And then uh, one of the, uh, the most common greetings in, in Hebrew today is uh, it, it sounds like this, you say, mashalomaka, which means, literally it means, how is your peace? Um, we would understand it to mean something like, how you doing? Okay, that's the way we would say it. But they would say, mashalomaka, how is your peace? And the proper response to that is, shalom li, which literally means, peace to me. And it's a way of saying, I'm, I'm fine, I'm good, I have peace. And so that word is still very prominent among Hebrew speakers. Uh, but in the Old Testament, the word means, and I'll just sort of give you uh, several, several meanings here to help you sort of picture the range of meaning. Uh, the word means being whole, uh, being intact, uh, it, it connotes well-being, um, a sense of completeness, and also a sense of fulfillment or being fulfilled. And uh, several other things as well, but th those are the ones most relevant to our study. But again, over 250 times the word appears, and so there's no way for us to you know, fully review all those. I thought what we'd do again this time is just do a, a little bit of a survey, uh, sort of a representative survey of the use of the word, and and that way sort of get a sense of of its force and its meaning. I thought we'd do it in in the way that the uh, Hebrew Old Testament is is divided up. That is, we'd start with the law. We'll look at a place in the law that it's used, and then we'll go. Um, to more like the history part of the Old Testament, and then we'll end up in the prophets. 
So let's begin in the law. And of course, there are lots of instances of this word in the law. We're just going to look at one. We're going to open to the book of Numbers, chapter 6. Numbers, chapter 6. And we'll read a few verses there in just a moment, beginning in verse 22. But uh, what we have here is what is often called the priestly blessing. Um, this, this is how the, the priests in the law were supposed to speak God's blessings over the people. So this was supposed to be a part of what they did. Normally they didn't just uh, you know, offer sacrifices at the temple. They were also to teach and minister to the people, the Old Testament Levitical priests. And uh, there is an actual blessing that God gave them through Moses' law. And that is contained beginning in verse 22 of number 6. Um, and there it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them. And then the actual blessing comes here, uh, beginning in verse 24. Here's what the priest was supposed to say in order to, to uh, pass on God's blessing to the people he was ministering to. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. There's our word. And then the chapter closes. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. Again, that's often called the, the priestly blessing. It's interesting. One of the uh, oldest inscriptions that have been found from the Old Testament is uh, uh, an inscription containing this text, the priestly blessing. They found it on uh, little silver scrolls, just tiny, about that big. And they think what they, there was, there were amulets, that is something that were, uh, was wore, maybe like a piece of jewelry, or maybe on the wrist, they're not sure. But on these tiny silver scrolls, they inscribed verses 24, 25, and 26. And these were discovered um, all within the last 50 or so years in the Bible lands. And it's one of the most ancient uh, inscriptions, maybe the most ancient from the Old Testament that have been found. But anyway, it just sort of shows you the importance of this text. And uh, in particular for our study, and notice that part of the blessing is, may the Lord give you shalom. May he give you peace there in verse 26. The Lord lift up his countenance, that is his face, upon you and give you peace. So again, we're reminded here that, that whatever peace is, it's something that comes from, from God. And... Uh, this was to be a part of the blessing that priests spoke over the Israelites, according to the law. So that's one place we see it, in the law. One of the really neat texts where we find this word is in more of the history section of the Old Testament. And that is 1 Chronicles chapter 22. 1 Chronicles chapter 22. And uh, we begin there in verse 6. I'm just going to read the passage first and then uh, point out a couple things for us. Uh, this is sort of the transition between David as king and his son Solomon as king. Uh, so it, it says in verse 6, Then he called for Solomon his son, that is David, he called for Solomon, his son, and charged him to build a house for the Lord, the God of Israel. David said to Solomon, My son, I had it in my heart to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, You have shed much blood and have waged great wars. 
You shall not build a house to my name, because you have shed so much blood before me on the earth. Behold, a son shall be born to you, who shall be a man of rest. I will give him rest from all his surrounding enemies. For his name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quiet to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name. He shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish his royal throne in Israel forever. So again, this is uh, when David is, is sort of passing the torch of leadership on to Solomon, David had, had wanted to build the temple, a uh, place of, of worship for, for the Lord, but God didn't allow him to do it, notice. And he's sort of recounting this to Solomon later, how the Lord had told him, you're not going to build me a temple. Your hands are, are filled with blood. You know, David was a, a warrior. Uh, not that he wasn't loved of God. In fact, we know that he was called a man after God's own heart, but he wasn't the one to build the temple. Um, God wanted Solomon to build the temple. And uh, and a big part of that was that man, David, he, he really hadn't been a man of peace in many ways. He had been the great Israelite warrior, uh, the warrior king. And so Solomon is going to be the one who builds it. It's interesting because Solomon's name uses the same letters as as our word for peace. I don't know if you can really hear it in English, but you know, the Hebrew word for peace again is shalom and Solomon's name Solomon in in Hebrew it's shilama. You can almost hear shalom in that. It's the same three basic letters. Um, in the original language. And so you know, Solomon's name, if it were to be translated literally, means something like peace man. Uh, not, not in a 60s sense, but man of peace. Uh, <clears throat> it has the same letters as, as the word for peace. And notice also in the midst of this, when God was saying why David wasn't allowed to build um, the temple, He's, he pr predicts to David, you know, a son shall be born to you, this is verse 9, who shall be a man of rest, implying that that wasn't really the case so much with David. But Solomon would be a man of rest. Um, that's a different word. It's not the same word as the word for peace, but it's a very interesting word that I'm greatly fascinated with, and I've been studying it for some time. Uh, that word rest, okay, that's used here, uh, Solomon is going to be a man of rest, is actually basically the same word as, as the name Noah. Um, in, in the Hebrew, Noah, Noah means rest. And uh, God says of Solomon that he's going to be a man of Noah. He's going to be a man of rest. And that's the one I want to build build the temple. I think next next uh, study we'll come back and look at that word a little bit more because that's directly related to this idea of peace. Uh, but God has Solomon build the temple and he, he says that he will give um, Israel a time of peace during the reign of the man of peace, during the reign of, of Solomon. Uh, now we Bible students uh, remember that you know Solomon was not perfect. Uh, he was never called a man after God's own heart. In fact, we know that his heart was led away from God um, in, later in life as he became sort of your typical politician. And, uh, and, and Solomon did what kings and politicians did in the ancient world. He, he married... Uh, uh, not in a godly way, but to, to make alliances with other nations and, and so forth, and had all kinds of wives and concubines that led him astray. In fact, uh, led him into idol worship and that kind of thing. So Solomon wasn't perfect, but for a period of time, uh, God gave Israel rest and peace 
during the reign of Solomon. And uh, this is just another little uh, insight into the, the meaning of this, um, this term um, that, we're, that we're looking at, uh, this term peace. Uh, it's a time of rest. So we've looked at uh, one place it occurs in the law, uh, one place in the history. And let's finish with the prophets. So um, basically the sec second half of the Old Testament is the prophets and this word shalom, peace, comes up time and again throughout the prophets. Just want to look at two passages uh, quickly with you to show this. The first one's in the first great prophet, Isaiah. So Isaiah chapter 54, if we can find that. Isaiah chapter 54 and um, beginning at verse eight. So the context again is uh, God has punished and is punishing his people. That's normally what the prophets are about. And he makes reference to this in, in verse 8. God is speaking. He says, In overflowing anger, for a moment, I hid my face from you. Now, remember, back in the priestly blessing in number 6, how God lift up his face upon them and gave them peace. Well, notice what's happened here. God said, I hid my face from you in overflowing anger for a moment. But, it goes on, with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you. Notice God's anger is just for a moment, but his love is everlasting. Big contrast. So I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. And then we get to, to the important part for us. He says in verse 9, this is like the days of Noah. Here comes Noah again. This is like the days of Noah to me, as I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. So he's talking about the time after the flood, when God's, remember, making a covenant with Noah and his descendants. He's never going to destroy the earth in this way again. And so as God reflects on the situation in Isaiah's day, he says, this is like the time of Noah. I swore that waters should no more go over the earth. And then he applies it to them. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. And my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. And that, I thought that was an important one to look at because that idea of a covenant of peace co comes back again and again in the Old Testament, especially in the prophets, that, that uh, peace a lot of times is associated with a covenant, uh, an agreement with God. Uh, it, was, it was the case with Abraham, uh, here it's mentioned in the days of Isaiah, and he makes reference to this covenant of peace that is, is not to be removed. And, um, you know, it, this idea of peace here seems to be associated with God's steadfast love. We notice that being mentioned a couple of times there, and his compassion. So it's all based on God and, and his character and who he is uh, that they can have peace. And that's important to remember. The last one is in one of my favorite Old Testament passages uh, in Ezekiel chapter 34. So if you just go over to Ezekiel 34, this is the great text about the shepherds of Israel and God as the good shepherd. You know, when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, he, he's reflecting on, in part, on this text in the Old Testament from Ezekiel. And uh, just to remind ourselves, you know, what's the situation in Ezekiel when we read it? The people are already in Babylonian exile. Ezekiel himself is in exile. Um, the prophecy starts way back in the opening chapters. Uh, it, Ezekiel says, he is by um, 
by the rivers of Babylon, you know. And he tells us in particular one that he is uh, by when he writes that. So uh, they're already in exile. They've already been punished. And, and they're starting through Ezekiel to get visions of the future from God. What's it going to be like? Has God really abandoned us here? And, and God is over and over saying, no, here is what it's going to be like in the future. Here is a vision of what's coming. And so as we read this here in a moment, you're going to see these words. You're going to see the word covenant again. And of course, the word peace. But also notice security and blessing and deliverance. All these words are, are coming into play here in Ezekiel 34. And again, what he's been doing in this particular chapter, he's been sort of condemning the shepherds of Israel. They're not taking care of their people. And he's saying, I'm going to take over and I'm going to shepherd my people. And so starting in verse 23, and we'll read down uh, to about verse 31 for our, our last passage for tonight. God says, and I will set up over them one shepherd, Again, God looking into the future. What's he going to do for his people? I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David. Now that is, that could be confusing because we realize David has been dead for a long time. By the time we, we read these words in Ezekiel, what's this about? My servant David, is he going to raise David from the dead? But remember, in, in the language of the prophets and even in the language of the New Testament, uh, who is the son of David, the one to come that God is going to work through? Well, we know who that is. Um, that's, that's the son of God. That's Jesus. And so Ezekiel passing on this future vision to the people, God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them a shepherd, one shepherd, my servant David, Another way of referring to the Christ. And he shall feed them. Jesus did that a lot, didn't he? Both spiritually and physically, he fed people. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord, I have spoken. Then it goes on. I will make with them a covenant of peace. So there, there's our word again. Peace is often associated with covenant, a covenant with God, being in relationship with God. Peace is the presence of God in our lives. It's being in fellowship with God. I will make with them a covenant of peace. And then it's just sort of beautiful the way God describes this. In language they could understand, we shouldn't necessarily always be looking for a literal fulfillment of each one of these. these are images painted of the future what's what's it like being in covenant with God what would most appeal to these people well listen to the way it's described I will make with them a covenant of peace and and banish wild beasts from the land and if you were surrounded all the time by wild beasts constantly threatening you wouldn't it be nice if God took them out of the way this is the way he describes the peace he's going to give them banish wild beasts from the land so that they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods not something we, we tend to to uh, take vacations in wilderness and woods right we're not we're not afraid of them because uh, They've largely been secured. We can do so safely. Not in, not in a place like Israel, in the ancient world, no. You didn't go out and sleep in the wilderness and, unless you had some other things going on. And you didn't sleep in the woods. But God was going to make it possible for them to dwell securely in places that, that often were threatening to them. And I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing, and I will send down the showers in their season. They shall be showers of blessing. We take for granted. We get rain all the time. Well, right now, snow, but 
Uh, you know what I mean. Okay, but if you live in an arid climate, if you live near desert, what a, uh, a beautiful promise. I will send down the showers in their season. They shall be showers of blessing. There's a song, uh, there shall be showers of blessing. This is where it comes from. And that goes on, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the earth shall yield its increase, and they shall be secure in their land. There's our word security. And they shall know that I am the Lord when I break the bars of their yoke and deliver them from the hand of those who enslave them. I'm going to bring them out of captivity. They, they shall no more be a prey to the nations nor shall the beasts of the land devour them. They shall dwell securely and none shall make them afraid. You get in the picture that God's painting of what peace is like. And I will provide for them renowned plantations so that they shall no more be consumed with hunger in the land and no longer suffer the reproach of the nations. Israel was always a small, relatively powerless nation.